section eight of the countess of lowndes square and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. Spook Stories. Chapter One. The Case of Frank Hampton. There was a light visible from the chinks and crevices of drawn curtains in the window of Dr. Rupert's study as I passed it on my way back from dinner one night he lived some six doors farther up the same street as i and since it had long been a frequent custom for us to smoke the go-to-bed cigarette together i rang and asked if he was at leisure his servant told me that he had already sent a message across to my house asking me to look in on him if i got home while the evening was not too far advanced for a casual conversational quarter of an hour and accordingly i took off my coat and went straight into the pleasant little front room about which hung the studious fragrance of the books that lined it from floor to ceiling arthur rupert was not alone this evening there was sitting on the near side of the fire which sparkled prosperously in this clear night of early december frost a young man whom i was sure i had never seen before as i entered he stopped in the middle of a sentence turning towards the door and i looked on the most handsome and diabolical face that i had ever beheld simultaneously rupert got up i hoped you would look in he said let me introduce you to my cousin mr hampton who is spending a day or two with me this is mr archdale frank of whom i was speaking just now as the other rose i saw that rupert's almost foolishly amiable fox terrier shrank away from where she had been sitting by her master's chair instead of giving me her accustomed and effusive greeting and retreated into a far corner of the room where she sat quivering with raised hackles and with vigilant eyes full of hate and terror fixed on young hampton his right arm was in a sling and he held out his left hand to me you must excuse me he said but i am only just recovering from a broken arm my cousin's dog doesn't approve of it she would like to get her teeth into it the oddest thing i ever saw archdale said rupert you know fifi's usual amiability call her frank frank hampton whistled and clicked his fingers together in an encouraging manner fifi come here fifi he said for a moment i thought that this most confiding of ladies was going to fly at him but apparently she could not find the courage for an attack and snapping and growling retreated behind the window curtains and that to me said hampton licking his lips as he spoke me who adore dogs don't you mr archdale as he said that i knew that he lied that fifi's detestation of him was met with a hatred quite as vivid but more controlled i can no more account for that conviction than for the sense of hellish evil that my first glance at him had conveyed to me he was quite young twenty-two or twenty-three for a guess and yet from behind the mask of that soft boyish face there looked out a spirit hard and malignant and mature an adept in terrible paths the impression was quite inexplicable but perfectly clear then looking across to rupert i saw he was watching his cousin with eager intentness i had to answer the direct question he had put to me but it required an effort to speak to him or to look at him no personally i don't care for dogs i said i rather dislike them and so enjoy a most unwelcome popularity among them fifi for instance your cousin will tell you how blind is her adoration for me see if fifi will come to you if i stand by you said hampton fifi had half emerged from her ambush behind the curtains and i called to her but she would not leave the retreat where her rage and terror had driven her 
she gave a little apologetic whine as if to signify that i was asking an impossible thing and beat with her stumpy tail on the carpet now go back to your chair again frank said rupert fifi needed no further invitation when he had left my neighbourhood she bundled herself across the room to me her thin white body curled like a comma wriggling with delight and making incomprehensible little explanations of her previous conduct but the moment that hampton moved in his chair she bolted away from me again he laughed and got up well i think i shall go to bed now that you have come to keep arthur company he said by the way where's your cat arthur i haven't seen her about all day he was facing sideways to rupert as he spoke and i noticed that he did not turn his head towards him this gave a certain casual cursory tone to his question making it appear a mere careless inquiry i haven't seen her either said rupert perhaps after taking counsel with fifi she has thought it prudent to fly from your baleful presence good night frank can you manage for yourself with your bandaged arm or shall i come and help you oh i'm all right thanks he said good night a kind good night fifi we shall be good friends before long arthur rupert had retired some two years before from regular medical practice in which as all the world knows he was undoubtedly the first authority on disease and aberrations of the brain and nervous system devoting his attention more particularly to those riddles of obscure and baffling disorders to which he so often supplied strange and correct answers he was possessed of an ample competence and so finding that his large professional practice did not permit him the leisure which was necessary for these exploratory studies he had though always willing to be consulted by his colleagues thrown up an active career for one of research he wanted to learn rather than to practice and without precisely mistrusting the methods which had earned him so brilliant a success had inferred the presence of huge fields of the unknown huge expanses of further possibilities which would perhaps put utterly out of date the most advanced of theories and treatments hitherto recognized in his profession at the time of his retirement he had once talked to me about the uncharted seas on to which he proposed to push forth the most advanced of actual practitioners he said are but groping in the dark on the threshold of real knowledge feeling for the handle fumbling for the bell at the most that is to say in cases of brain disease and nerve disorder we try to get at the mind of the patient and influence that so that it not we may exert its healing power and cure the imperfect functioning of the material part of course that is a tremendous step forward when we look at what medical science was twenty years ago when doctors prescribed tonics tonics to heal the physical damage caused by a disordered mind but mind itself is but a very subordinate denizen in that house of mystery which we call man mind is no more than the servant who comes to the door and takes your hat and coat and tells you in a word or two how the patient has been mind is not the master of the house whom you have really come to see and who sits there alone mortally sick perhaps and in terror and darkness for the master of the house is the spirit we have got to examine him before we can touch the source of these diseases for the farther that science advances the more certain it is that there is a master sitting within to whom the mind is only the servant as for the body the tissues the nerves the grey matter what shall we say that is why it's no more than the servant's clothes his jacket or his boots i'm not going to stay talking in the hall to mind the servant any longer i shall leave him there and go straight up to the sick chamber i shall be called all sorts of names charlatan spiritualist what you will but i don't care two straws about that besides i know quite well that my colleagues will still be glad to call me in when they are puzzled and i hope to be better equipped to help them i won't reject any jungle path without exploring it 
not witchcraft nor demoniacal possession nor all the myths which science thinks she has exploded in its first origin everything must be spiritual be it comet or toothache or genius just as mental suggestion has taken the place of tonics so must spiritual healing take the place of mental suggestion the spirit is the original manifestation of god in man and it is on prayer and on faith that the whole science of healing will some day rest but first we have to investigate the conditions the environment the life for these two years then which had followed his retirement rupert had given himself to these studies of occult and spiritual influences learning about the healing powers contained in mental suggestion and trying to get behind that into the more elemental and essential mysteries of man leaving the servant as he had said in the hall of the house while he went further into the presence of the master of the house often during these go-to-bed cigarettes that multiplied themselves into the night he told me tales that did not make going to sleep any easier nothing was too extravagant for his investigations witchcraft spiritualism satanism the healing touch and above all demoniacal possession were the subjects of this study that went deeper into the human organism than mind there was no myth or exploded superstition that he did not examine to see whether the explosion had been complete and shattering or whether among the debris there did not remain some grains of solid stuff that were still solid though science had affirmed that a puff of scattered smoke was all that was extant consequently this evening when frank hampton had gone to bed i was quite prepared to find that rupert had something to tell some guess to hazard that had illumined his inquiries the more so indeed because i had not seen him for some dozen nights did you receive the message i left at your house he asked abruptly as the door closed behind his cousin no i haven't been home but your servant told me you had asked me to come in said i yes i did you have done just what i wanted in my note i asked you to come in and observe my cousin and tell me your impression i saw you couldn't help observing him so now let us have the impression quite frankly all i said of course i never saw any one so utterly terrible i said terrible exactly how he asked the very intensity of my feeling about hampton blurred the outline of it and i paused trying to put a definite shape to it incomparably terrible i said murderous i think murderous for the fun of it i felt like fifi i saw you did he said and i suspect you are right you and fifi he walked up and down the room once or twice then sat down with the air of settling himself did you hear him ask about my cat he said he killed her last night he buried her in the garden there was a grotesqueness a ludicrousness even in this after the talk of murder but that only added horror to it what do you mean i asked precisely what i say it so happened that i slept very badly last night because as a matter of fact i was thinking about frank and wondering if i was on the horrible track which would show me what ailed him about three in the morning i heard the door into the garden being opened the window of my bedroom which was open is just above it the idea of burglars occurred to me and without turning on my light i went and looked out there was bright clear starlight and i saw frank come out of the house carrying something white in his arm he put it down to fetch a spade from the tool house and i saw what it was he dug up a couple of plants with lumps of soil round their roots working slowly for he could only use one arm he buried the cat in the excavation and very carefully replanted the michaelmas daisies over it then more terribly yet he knelt down by the grave and i could hear him sobbing sobbing i asked yes what he said to-night is 
or was perfectly true he used to be devoted to dogs and indeed all animals especially cats now last night out in the garden he was in his dressing-gown when he came down to breakfast this morning he said his nose had been bleeding rather severely he was uneasy about it and i went up to his bedroom and found a good deal of blood in his slop pail his dressing-gown was lying on his bed and there too was more blood and a quantity of cat's hairs i told him not to think about it any more there was nothing in the least alarming and when he had gone out in order to make quite sure i dug up the michaelmas daisies for the second time below i found the body of my poor cat he had cut its throat he would kill fifi if he could he is longing to but the fellow is a fiend said i for the present he is a fiend or something very like it he used not to be until the day on which he broke his arm pray god he will cease being what he is till the day he broke his arm i asked yes now do you want to hear the wildest and most extravagant tale which i believe to be literally and awfully true concerning this i asked of course also are you disposed to sit up late to-night there may be some confirmatory evidence about my story i expect reed the medium here at twelve there is time for me to give you my theory before he comes till any hour said i good then listen he spoke slowly putting his hands over his eyes as he so often does when he wants to shut out all external disturbances and concentrate himself on the history of a case two months ago he said as you may possibly remember a man called james rolls was hanged at beltonborough for the most atrocious murder of his wife the deed apparently was quite objectless there had been no quarrel and after it was done he seemed sometimes to be distressed at the crime sobbing and crying sometimes to gloat over it recounting it with gusto there was no question whatever about his guilt only about his sanity and with regard to that these fits of remorse and enjoyment might be assumed in order to produce the impression that he was not accountable for his actions he was examined by a government expert who asked me to come down with him and form my conclusion we could neither of us find any other symptom of insanity about him but there was a certain conjecture in my head about what he called the history of the case and i stopped down at beltonborough for a day or two in order to make further observations as i was having an interview with him i suddenly asked him this question did you begin by killing flies usually he was rather sullen and silent and often would not answer but when i asked him this his eye brightened and he said yes flies first and then cats and dogs after that i could get nothing further out of him but i had got what i was expected to get in all other respects he was as far as i could judge perfectly sane and it was scarcely possible to call him a homicidal maniac for he had never before shown signs of wanting to take human life as it was he had committed an atrocious murder and had he been shut up as a homicidal maniac I do not think there is any doubt that by this time he would have killed a warder now now no man in a fit of rage is altogether sane and yet we do not commute the sentence of those who have killed another when beside themselves with passion and james rolls had not even that extenuation he was hanged but i feel convinced that frank is suffering from an early stage of james rolls's malady i feel convinced also that the hanging of james rolls infected him with it the hanging of james rolls caused it i asked i do not doubt it as you will see when i state my theory but i hope to prove that my theory is correct and i hope to cure my cousin 
rupert sat up and looked at me while he said this then he sank back in his chair again and as before covered his eyes with his hands now for the theory he said there is a very steep hill in beltonboro with a sharp dangerous corner just outside the prison gate practically at the moment when james rolls was being taken to the scaffold frank came tearing down this hill on his bicycle to catch an early train to town he skidded and fell just outside the prison and sustained compound fracture of his right arm it was important that he should be moved as little as possible and they carried him straight into the prison infirmary where chloroform was administered and the prison surgeon set his arm it was a very bad fracture and he was under the anaesthetic for a considerable time and when he came round he was changed it seemed as if another spirit had taken possession of his body he was not the same person from being a charming boy he had become something hellish rupert sat up again and looked at me there is a theory he said that in certain conditions such as deep mesmeric trance or under the stupefaction of some complete anaesthetic the bonds that seem so indissolubly to unite a man's spirit to his mind and his body are strangely loosened the condition approaches to that of temporary death often under an anaesthetic the beat of the heart is nearly suspended often the breathing is nearly suspended and this happened to frank under chloroform that morning the connection between his spirit and his body was loosened there is another theory which you must consider also it is proved i think beyond all doubt that at the moment of death particularly of sudden and violent death the spirit though severed from the body which it has inhabited does not at once leave its vicinity but remains hovering near to its discarded tenement from which it has been expelled well at that hour when frank's spirit was maintaining but a relaxed hold on his body another spirit violent and strong was close at hand a spirit that had just been disembodied and i believe the spirit of james rolls entered and took possession i felt then what i have felt before and since namely some stir of horror in my head that made my hair move you can often see it in dogs i had seen it to-night in fifi when terror or rage erects their hackles but the experience was only momentary and the flame of this thing its awful and burning quality licked hotly round me and how is reed to help i asked he may be able to test for us part at any rate of my theory said rupert he is an extraordinarily powerful medium in the way of producing materialized forms of spirits and i believe him to be honest and high-minded now if frank's body is possessed by this murderous spirit it is at least possible that frank's own spirit now unhoused and evicted will be hovering near its rightful habitation we will ask if the spirit of frank hampton is here we will ask if it can assume material form if reed can produce this materialization it will doubtless wear the appearance of frank we will try anyhow ah no doubt that is reed a very gentle tapping sounded on the front door just outside the room and rupert got up i told reed not to ring he said for fear that frank should hear i will let him in he left the room and in another moment came back with the medium a small perfectly commonplace-looking man smug and prosperous then i met his eyes and thought him commonplace no longer they seemed to look out and through and beyond in a few minutes rupert who had often sat with reed before explained what was wanted he told him that he wished to know if the spirit of frank hampton was about and if so whether we could communicate with it or see it that was all reed asked only one question has frank hampton's spirit been long out of his body 
he said rupert hesitated for a moment i believe it to have been out of his body for about two months he answered the electric light was put out but the glow from the fire was bright enough to make a red twilight in the room i could clearly see the profile of the medium black against that illumination the back of the chair in which he sat the full face of rupert glints of reflected light on the glass of pictures and with perfect distinctness fifi who had curled herself up on the hearth-rug almost immediately the medium went into trance and i saw his head bowed over his chest and heard his breathing which had been short and panting as he passed into unconsciousness grow quiet again how long we sat there in silence without anything supernormal occurring i do not know but it appeared to me not to be many minutes before a very loud rap sounded from the table which began to quiver under our hands then rupert asked is the spirit of frank hampton here there was the assent of three raps shall we be able to see you he asked there were two raps and after a pause a third again we sat in silence this time for a much longer period and i think the clock on the mantelpiece twice chimed the quarter hour then from the direction of the door there blew across the room a very cold current of air and the curtains in the window stirred with it fifi i imagine felt it too for she sat up sneezed and drew herself a little nearer to the fire simultaneously i was inwardly aware that there was something somebody in the room which had not been there before it had not entered through the door for when the current of the air began to blow i looked at it and certainly it had not opened then rupert whispered look it is coming the medium's head had fallen back and over his chest in the region of the heart there appeared a faint luminous area inside which there was going on some energy some activity whirls and spirals of grey curling and intertwining and growing thicker and extending began building themselves up in the air for some little while i could not make out what it was that was thus taking shape in the red twilight then as the materialization progressed it defined itself into a human form swathed in some misty and opaque vesture at the top above shoulders now quite formed there rose the outline of a head features growing every moment more distinct fashioned the face of it and pallid and silent fading into darkness below stood the head and torso of a human being the face was clearly recognizable it was scarce an hour since i had looked on those features but it wore so heart-broken an anguish in the curves of that beautiful mouth and in the tortured eyes that my throat worked for very pity and compassion then rupert spoke frank he said the head bowed the lips moved but i heard nothing why are you not in your body he asked this time there came a whisper just audible i can't i can't he said someone is there someone terrible for god's sake help me the white agonized face grew more convulsed i can't bear it it said for god's sake for god's sake i looked away from that face for a moment to the hearth-rug where a sudden noise attracted my attention fifi was sitting bolt upright looking eagerly upwards and the noise i heard was the pleased thumping of her tail then she came cautiously forward still gazing at the image which an hour before had driven her frenzied with rage and terror uttering little anxious whinings seeking attention finally she held out a paw and gave the short whisper of a bark with which she demands the notice of her favourites 
and if i had been inclined to doubt before i think that i would now have been convinced that here in some inscrutable manifestation was the true frank hampton once more rupert spoke i will do all that man can do frank he said and by god's grace we will restore you the figure slowly faded some of it seemed withdrawn back into the medium some to be dispersed in the dusk before long reed's breath again grew quick and laboured as he passed out of trance and then drenched with sweat he came to himself rupert told him that the seance had been successful and then turning on the light again we all sat still while the medium recovered from his exhaustion before he left rupert engaged him to hold himself in readiness for a further seance next day in case he was telephoned for and when he had gone we drew up our chairs to the fire while fifi went nosing about the room as if searching for traces of a friend for a long time rupert sat in silence frowning heavily at the fire asking me some question from time to time to satisfy himself that our impressions had been identical then he appeared to make up his mind i shall do it he said at least i shall make the attempt that was frank whom we saw just now up to that point my theory is confirmed of course there's a risk there's an awful risk but archdale wouldn't anybody take any risk to cure the anguish we looked upon that was a human spirit man disembodied but not dead and it knows that its earthly habitation is being defiled and profaned by that murderous occupant it sees the horrors that its own hands work the brain that was its pleasant servant is planning worse things yet i can't doubt that this is so no reasonable man can doubt so incredible and so damnable a thing but if the struggle that there must be is too much for the body that we seek to free good lord what a tale for a coroner's inquest you mean that you risk your cousin's death i asked necessarily who can tell what will happen but that is not all for of what nature is the spirit which we hope to expel from that poor lad's body a strong and a desperate one or it could never have taken possession of it it will cling with all its force to the tenement which it has usurped and if we drive it out if god helps us to do that what awful and evil power will once more be abroad but we can't help that there is holy justice and reparation to be done and we can't count the cost now let me think again he got up and began pacing up and down the room now muttering to himself now speaking aloud as if in argument with me it's a terrible risk for reed too he said for reed most of all for he will be in deep trance such power of faith as we can exert must defend him first of all yet we can't get at rolls i tell you without the medium i must of course tell reed everything and ask him if he will take the risk he may refuse though i don't think he will for there's the courage of a saint in that man then there's frank frank's body i mean that must be absolutely unconscious when the operation takes place no human nerves could stand it nor with that fiend in possession would he consent to it deep the deepest possible unconsciousness by jove there's that new german drug which appears safe enough and it certainly produces a sleep that comes nearest of all to death it seems to stupefy the very spirit itself hyocampine of course don't tell me you haven't heard of it tasteless too it's a good thing that the criminal classes can't get hold of it well there we are prayer and faith in an almighty power lighten our darkness we beseech thee o lord he does too if our motives are right that's one of the few facts we can be sure about you can run a lot of risks if you utterly believe that suddenly the whole burden of perplexity and anxious thought seemed lifted off his mind 
i'll go and see reed to-morrow morning he said i believe he will consent when he knows all and you do you want to see the end of it and look on the glory of god come if you like but if you come you must be strung up to the highest pitch of trust and serenity that you are capable of yes do be here you believe that all evil however deadly and powerful is altogether inferior in calibre and fighting power to good also i shall like a friend at my elbow perhaps i oughtn't to urge that as a reason for i don't want any personal feeling to influence you only come if you want to witness the power of god not reeds not mine we are nothing at all except mere mossy channels for one moment he paused and i knew that he was wavering himself in the weakness of the flesh but instantly he got hold of himself again there's only one power that can't fail he said hell crashes into fragments against it next morning i got a note from rupert saying that reed consented and asking me to come into his house punctually at half-past two if i had decided to be with him when i arrived i found rupert and frank hampton sitting over their coffee in the study hampton had just drunk his isn't there a home for cats somewhere in battersea he was asking i'll go and find a new one for you as yours appears to have vanished entirely he yawned it's a feeble habit to go to sleep after lunch he said but i really think i shall have a nap i've got an astonishing inclination that way give me half an hour will you and then we'll go down to the cat's home and get a large fat cat i guessed that rupert had already given his cousin the dose of hyocampine and just as the latter was pulling a chair round so that he need not face the light he spoke make a proper job of it frank he said and lie on the sofa one always wakes feeling cramped if one goes to sleep in a chair hampton's eyelids were already drooping but he shuffled heavily across to the sofa all right he mumbled sorry for being so rude mr mr archdale but i must have just forty i wonder why forty and immediately he went to sleep rupert waited a moment but hampton did not stir again then he went out and returned with reed who had been waiting in his bedroom all explanations had already been made and in silence we darkened the room by drawing the thick curtains across the window only a little light came in from their edges but as last night the firelight flickered on the walls then rupert locked the door and we took our places round the table into thy hands o lord we commend our spirits he said before many minutes were over the medium's head dropped forward and after a little struggle he went into trance the spirit of james rolls said rupert in the silence that followed i could hear the slow breathing of hampton as he slept in that remote unconsciousness a chink of light from the window fell full on his face and i could see it very distinctly then i heard him breathing quicker and a shudder passed through him shaking the sofa where he lay his face hitherto serene and quiescent began to twitch he can't wake whispered rupert i gave him the full dose then not from the door at all but from the direction of the sofa there came an icy blast of wind and simultaneously a shattering rap from the table is that james rolls asked rupert three raps answered him then in the name of god said rupert in a loud steady voice come from where you are and be made manifest suddenly hampton began to groan his mouth worked and he ground his teeth together a horrible convulsion seized his face a distortion of rending agony like that which sometimes seizes on a dying man whose body clings desperately to the spirit that is emerging from it a rattle 
and a strangled gulping came from his throat and the foam gathered on his lips it is there that you are james rolls said rupert in a loud voice of exultation in the name of god come out the convulsions redoubled themselves the body writhed and bent like that of a poisoned man then round the face brightest about the mouth there formed a pale greenish light corrupt and awful it began to wreathe itself into lines and curves weaving and intertwining it grew in height like a luminous column built without hands in the darkness it defined itself into human form until in the air just above the recumbent body it stood complete with its emergence the convulsions and the groaning subsided and at the end when this wraith in semblance of a swathed man with face of such murderous cruelty that i shuddered as i looked at it stood fully fashioned and finished the body of frank hampton lay quite still in that sleep which was nearest of all to death then rupert's voice spoke again clear and peremptory and triumphant begone james rolls he cried very slowly the materialized spirit began to move floating like a balloon in an almost windless air slowly it drifted towards us with its eyes fixed on the unconscious medium and alight with awful purpose its mouth curled into some sort of hellish smile it came quite close to him as if sucked there and the edge of its outline began to extend towards him a feeler as of a little whirlpool of water drawn down into a sink till the end of it just touched him in the name of the holiest and by the power of the highest shouted rupert i bid you go to the place that he has appointed for you then i can only describe what happened by saying that some shock blinding deafening overwhelming every sense shook the room it leaped into a blaze of light a thunder of sound rent the air and yet i knew that all this came from within was the echo of the spiritual crisis that raged around us made manifest to the bodily sense and silence as of the frozen polar night succeeded then once again a light began to be built up over hampton's body that lay utterly still beside the curtains it fashioned itself but only very faintly into the outline of a man and this seemed to be drawn inwards and absorbed by that motionless figure we waited till it had disappeared altogether the medium stirred and struggled it is over he said and laid his head on his arms rupert got up and drew back the curtains from outside the door came scratchings and whinings and presently he unlocked it and let fifi in she saluted everybody in her exuberant fashion then came to the sofa sniffed and jumped up on it wagging her tail it was not till late in the afternoon that frank hampton came to himself a beautiful spirit looked out of those jolly boyish eyes end of section eight section nine of the countess of lowne square and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. The Countess of Lowne Square and Other Stories by E. F. Benson Spook Stories, Chapter 2, Mrs. Andrews' Control Mrs. Andrews was certainly Athenian by nature, and it was her delight not only to hear some new thing, but to put it into practice. 
Enjoying excellent health, she was able to take almost any liberties with her constitution, and for a long time was absorbed in the maelstrom of diets, each of which seemed to suit her to perfection. For a couple of months she adopted the Pembroke treatment, and droves of sheep were sacrificed to supply her with sufficient minced mutton, while the utmost resources of the kitchen boiler were needed to give her the oceans of hot water which she found necessary to drink all day, except at meals. Having obtained the utmost benefits derivable from this system, she nourished her ample and vigorous frame, by way of a change, on pyramids of grated nuts, carefully weighed out, and it cannot be doubted that she would enthusiastically have fed herself on chopped, hard-boiled egg, like a canary, if she could have found any system of diet that inculcated such a proceeding. Her husband, for all his mild and apparently yielding disposition, must at bottom have been a man of iron soul, for he absolutely refused to embark on any of these experiments, though he never dissuaded his wife from doing so, and stuck firmly, like a limpet, to his three solid and satisfactory meals, not disdaining minced mutton, nor even a modicum of milled nuts, when he felt that they would be agreeable, but adding them to his ordinary diet without relying on them. The two, childless and middle-aged, lived in extreme happiness and comfort together, and no doubt Mrs. Andrews' enthusiasms and the perennial amusement her husband derived from them served to keep the sunlight of life shining on them. They were never bored and always busy, which perhaps even more than diet secured them serenity of health. But there came a time when Mrs. Andrews, in an unacknowledged despair of feeling better and more vigorous physically than she always did, turned her Athenian mind towards mental and psychical fads. She began by telling the fortunes of her friends by means of cards, and though she could always say how she knew, following the rules of her primer, that her husband had had scarlet fever when he was twenty-three, yet the fact that she knew it perfectly well without the help of the cards made the divination rather less amazing. She tried Christian science, though only for a short time, since no amount of demonstration over false claims could rid her one day of the conviction that she had a raging toothache, whereas the dentist convinced her in a moment, by the short though agonising application of the pinches, that she could remove the toothache, which had resisted all the precepts of her temporary creed. An excursion into the realms of astrology succeeded this, and conjointly a study of palmistry, and at this point her husband, for the first time, began to take an interest in his wife's preoccupations. It certainly did seem very odd that his horoscope should testify to the identical events which the lines in his hand so plainly showed his wife, and certain apparent discrepancies were, no doubt, capable of explanation. When he knew that the right hand indicated what nature meant him to be, and the left hand what he had made of himself, it could not but be gratifying to find he had lived so closely up to his possibilities, and it was pleasant, again, to find his wife so enthusiastic about his plump pink palm. "'A most remarkable hand, dear,' she said. "'I never saw evidence of such pluck and determination. And look at your Mount of Jupiter! Splendid!' Mr. Andrews did not know exactly what the Mount of Jupiter was, but he knew what pluck and determination were. "'Upon my word, my dear,' he said, "'there may be something in it. "'I will borrow your primer, if I may. "'And now, about the future.' "'Mrs. Andrews was already peering eagerly into the future. "'This was as splendid as the Mount of Jupiter. "'Such a line of life,' she said. "'Let me see. "'You are fifty-eight, are you not? "'Well,' On it goes. Sixty, seventy, eighty, without a break in it. Why, I declare, it reaches ninety, Henry. This was very gratifying, and it showed only ordinary politeness on Henry's part to inquire into his wife's prospects. Ah, I haven't such a line as you, dear, she said, 
But after all, if I live in perfect health till I'm eighty-two, which is what my hand tells me, I'm sure there's no reason to complain, and I for one shan't. But when Mrs. Andrews had told the fortunes of her husband and all her friends, and secured them, on the whole, such charming futures, it was no wonder that she went further into matters more psychical and occult. A course of gazing into the most expensive crystal proved disappointing, since she could never see anything except the reflection of the objects in the room, while her husband, now actively taking part in these investigations, merely fell asleep when he attempted to see anything there. They both hoped that this might not be ordinary sleep, but the condition of deep trance, which they found was one of the accompanying phenomena, and productive of great results. But these trances were so deep that no recollection of what occurred therein ever remained in his mind, with the exception of one occasion, on which he dreamed about boiled rabbit. As he had partaken of this disgusting provender at lunch that day, both Mrs. Andrews and he regarded this dream as retrospective in character, and as not possessed of prophetic significance. It was about this time that they both became members of the Psychical Research Society, and their attention could not but be struck by the wonderful phenomena resulting from the practice of automatic writing. If you had a psychical gift in this direction, and it was now the settled conviction of both Henry Andrews and his wife that they had, all apparently that had to be done was to hold a pencil over a writing pad conveniently placed, abstract your mind from the hand that held the pencil, and sit there to see what happened. The theory was that some controlling spirit might take possession of the pencil and dictate messages from the other world, which the pencil would record. Eager study of the psychical journals warned them that patient practice might be necessary before any results were arrived at, the reason being that the control must get used to the novel instrument of communication, and warning was given that they must not be discouraged if, for a long time, nothing was recorded on the paper except meaningless lines. But it appeared that most people, if they would only be patient enough, would be rewarded by symptoms of the presence of a control before very long, and when once a beginning was made, progress was apt to be very rapid. It was recommended also that practice should be regular, and, if possible, should take place at the same time every day. The idea fired Mrs. Andrews at once. "'Upon my word, dear Henry,' she said, "'I think it is very well worth trying, for the crystal is yielding no results at all. Psychical gifts are possessed by everybody in some degree, so this very interesting article says, and if ours do not lie in the direction of crystal gazing, it makes it all the more probable that we shall achieve something in automatic writing, and as for a regular time for practising it, what could be more pleasant than to sit out in the garden after tea, when you have come in from your golf, and enjoy these warm evenings with the feeling that we are occupying ourselves, instead of sitting idle, as we are apt to do? Henry distinctly approved of the suggestion. He was often a little fatigued after his golf, though he was going to live till ninety, and the prospect of sitting quietly in a chair in the garden, instead of feeling that he ought to be weeding, was quite a pleasant one. "'Then shall we each sit with paper and pencil, dear?' he asked. Mrs. Andrews referred to the essay that gave elementary instruction. "'Certainly,' she said. "'We will try that first. They say that two hands holding the pencil often produces extraordinary results, but we will begin, as they suggest, singly. I declare that my hand feels quite fidgety already, as if the control was just waiting for the means of communication to be prepared. Everything in Mrs. Andrews's house was in apple pie order, and it took her no time at all to find two writing pads and a couple of sharpened pencils. With these, she rejoined her husband on the paved walk, where they had had tea, outside the drawing-room, and, with pencil in hand, fixed her eye firmly on the top of the mulberry tree at the edge of the lawn, and waited. He, with left hand free for his cigarette, 
did the same, but his mind kept going back to the boiled rabbit he had dreamed of after crystal-gazing, which still seemed to him a very unusual occurrence, for, to the best of his recollection, he had never dreamed of boiled rabbit before. Within a few days' time, very promising developments had taken place. Almost immediately, Mrs. Andrews had begun to trace angled lines on the paper, which, if they did not suggest anything else particular, were remarkably like the temperature chart of a very feverish patient. Her hand, seemingly without volition on her part, made energetic dashes and dabs all over the paper, and she felt a very odd tingling sensation in her fingers, which could scarcely be put down to anything else than the presence of the control. Her husband, scarcely less fortunate, also began to trace queer patterns of irregular curves on his sheet, which looked very much as if they were words. But though they were like words, they were not any known words, whichever way up you attempted to read them, though, as Mrs. Andrews said, they might easily be Russian or Chinese, which would account for their being wholly meaningless to the English eye. Sheets of possible Russian were thus poured out by Mrs. Andrews, and whole hospital records of fever charts on the part of his wife, but neither at present came within measurable distance of intelligibility. The control seemed incapable of making itself understood. Then, on a memorable day, Mr. Andrews's pencil evinced an irresistible desire to write figures, and after inscribing one, two, one, two, a great many times, wrote quite distinctly four, nine, five, eight, and gave a great dash as if it had said its last word. And what four, nine, five, eight indicates, my dear, said he, passing it over to Mrs. Andrews, I think we must leave to the control to determine. She looked at it a moment in silence. Then, a great thought splendidly striking her, she rose in some excitement. Henry, it's as plain as plain, she said. I am forty-nine, and you are fifty-eight. Our ages are thus wonderfully conjoined. It certainly means that we must act together. Come and hold my pencil with me. Well, this is very curious, said Henry, and did as he was told. At this point, their experiments entered the second phase, and the pencil thus jointly held at once developed an intelligible activity. Instead of mere fever charts and numerals, it began to produce whole sentences which were true to the point of being positive truisms. Before they went to dinner that night, they were told, in a large, sprawling hand, that wisdom is more than wealth, and that fearlessness is best, and that hate blinds the eyes of love. The very next day, more unimpeachable sentiments were poured forth, and at the end was written, from Pocky. Pocky, then, was clearly the control. He became, to Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, an established personality, with a mind stored with moral generalities. Very often some practical application could be made of his dicta, as, for instance, when Mr. Andrews was hesitating as to whether to invest quite a considerable sum of money in a rather speculative venture. But, recollecting what Pocky had said, that wisdom is better than wealth, he very prudently refrained, and had the satisfaction of seeing the speculative concern come a most tremendous smash very soon after. But it required a good deal of ingenuity to fit Pocky's utterances into the affairs of daily life, and Mr. Andrews was getting a little tired of these generalities when the curtain went up on the third phase. This was coincident with the outbreak of the German war, when nothing else was present in the minds of husband and wife, and Pocky suddenly became patriotic and truculent. For a whole evening he wrote, Kill them, treacherous Germans, avenge the scrap of paper. 
and very soon after, just when England generally was beginning to be excited over the rumour that hosts of Russians were passing through the country to the French battlefront, he made a further revelation of himself. The hosts of Russia are with you, he wrote. Cossacks from the steppes, troops of the great white Tsar, hundreds and thousands, Russia to England, England to France, the Allies triumph, from Poksky. The pencil gave a great dash and flew from the fingers that held it. It was all most clearly written, and in a voice that trembled with excitement, Mrs. Andrews read it out. There, my dear, she said, I don't think we need have any further doubt about the Russians. And look how it is signed. Not Pocky any longer, but Poksky. That is a Russian name, if ever there was one. Poksky, so it is, said Mr. Andrews, putting on his spectacles. Well, this is most wonderful. And to think that in those early days when my pencil used to write things we couldn't read, you suggested it might be Russian. I feel no doubt that it was, said Mrs. Andrews, firmly. I wish now that we had kept them, and my writing too, which you used to call the fever charts. I dare say some poor fellow in hospital had temperatures like that. Mr. Andrews did not feel so sure of this. That sounds a little far-fetched, dear, he said, though I quite agree with you about the possibility of its being Poksky who wrote through me. I wonder who he was. Some great general, probably. You can easily imagine the excitement that pervaded Oakley in the weeks that followed, when every day brought some fresh butler or railway porter into the public press, who had told somebody, who had told the author of the letter in question, that he had seen bearded soldiers stepping out of trains with blinds drawn, and shaking the snow off their boots. It mattered nothing that the whole romance was officially denied. Indeed, it only made Mrs. Andrews very indignant at the suppression of war news. The War Office may say what it likes, she exclaimed, and indeed it seems to make it its business to deny what we all know to be true. I think I must learn a few words of Russian, in case I meet any soldier with a beard. God save the Tsar, or something of the kind. I shall send for a Russian grammar. Now, let us see what Poksky has to tell us tonight. That no further confirmation of Poksky's announcements on this subject ever came to light was scarcely noticed by the automatic writers. For Poksky was bursting with other news. He rather terrified his interpreters when there was nervousness about possible Zeppelin raids by saying, Fires from the wicked ones in the clouds. Fourteen, twelve, fourteen, Seller, best. Since this could hardly mean anything but that a raid was to be expected on the 14th of December, and Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, and indeed a large number of their friends, spent the evening in their cellars, coming out again when it was definitely after midnight. But the relief at finding that no harm had been done speedily obliterated the feeling that Poksky had misled them, and when, on Christmas Eve, he said, Spirit of peace descends. Though certain people thought he meant that the war would soon be over, the truce on the Western Front for Christmas Day was more generally believed to bear out this remarkable prophecy. All through the spring, Poksky continued voluble. He would not definitely commit himself over the course that Italy was to take, but, as Mrs. Andrews triumphantly pointed out, Italy would not definitely commit herself either, which just showed how right Poksky was. He rather went back to the Pocky style over this and said, Prudence is better than precipitation. Italy prepares before making decision. Wisdom guides her counsels, and wisdom is ever best. From Poksky. Intermittently, the forcing of the Dardanelles occupied him. Now, here a rather odd point arose. Mr. Andrews, at this time, had to spend a week in town, and only Mrs. Andrews held the pencil, which the intelligence of Poksky used to express himself with. In all these messages, Poksky spelled the name of the straits Dardanelles, D-A-R, 
D-A-N-E-L-S, which, for all I know, may be the Russian form. But two days ago, Mrs. Andrews kindly sent me one of his messages, which I was glad to see was most optimistic in tone. She enclosed a note from herself saying, You will see what Poxky says about the Dardanelles. Isn't he wonderful? So, Mrs. Andrews, writing independently of Poxky, spells Dardanelles, D-A-R-D-A-N-E-L-S, the same way as Poxky does when he controls the pencil. I can't help wondering if the control is, shall we say, quite complete. I wonder also how the straits will themselves be spelt when Mr. Andrews returns. It's all rather puzzling. End of section 9《Section 10 of the Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Follis. The Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. Spook Stories, Chapter 3 The Ape Hugh Marsham had spent the day, as a good tourist should, in visiting the temples and the tombs of the kings across the river, and the magic of the hour of sunset flamed over earth and heaven as he crossed the Nile again to Luxor in his felucca. It seemed as if the whole world had been suddenly transferred into the heart of an opal and burned with a myriad fiery colours. The river itself was of the green that beech trees are clad in at springtime. The columns of the temple that stood close to its banks glowed as if lit from within by the flame of some perpetual evening sacrifice. The cloudless sky was dusky blue in the east, the blue of turquoise overhead, and melted into aquamarine above the line of desert where the sun had just sunk. All along the bank, which he was fast approaching under the press of the cool wind from the north, were crowds of Arabs, padding softly home in the dust from their work, and chattering as sparrows chatter among the bushes in the long English twilight. Even the dust that hovered and hung and was dispersed again by the wind was rainbowed. It caught the hues from the river and the sky and the orange flaming temple, and those who walked in it were clad in brightness. Here in the south no long English twilight lingered, and as he walked up the dusky fragrant tunnel of mimosa that led to the hotel, night thickened and in the sky a million stars leaped into being while the soft gathering darkness sponged out the glories of the flaming hour on the hotel steps the vendors of carpets and arabian hangings of incense and filigree work of suspicious turquoises and more than suspicious scarabs were already packing up their wares and probably recounting to each other in their shrill incomprehensible gabble the iniquitous bargains they had made with the gullible americans and english who so innocently purchased the wares of manchester only in his accustomed corner old abdul still squatted for he was of a class above the ordinary vendors a substantial dealer in antiques who had a shop in the village where archaeologists resorted and bought sub rosa pieces that eventually found their way into european museums he was in his shop all day but evening found him when serious business hours were over on the steps of the hotel where he sold undoubted antiquities to tourists who wanted something genuine the day had been very hot and hugh felt himself disposed to linger outside the hotel in this cool dusk and turn over the tray of scarabs which abdul hamid presented to his notice he was a wrinkled dried-up husk of a man 
loquacious and ingratiating in manner and welcomed hugh as an old customer see sir he said here are two more scroll scarabs like those you bought from me before the week you should have these they are very fine and very cheap because i do no business this year mr rankin you know him of the british museum he give me two pounds each last year for scroll scarabs not so fine and to-day i sell them at a pound and a half each take them they're yours scroll scarabs of the twelfth dynasty if mr rankin were here he pay me two pounds each and be sorry i not ask more hugh laughed you may sell them to mr rankin then he said he comes here to-morrow the old man utterly unabashed grinned and shook his head no i promised you them for pound and a half he said i am not cheap dealer they are yours pound and a half take them take them hugh resisted this unparalleled offer and turning over the contents of the tray picked out of it and examined carefully a broken fragment of blue glaze about an inch in height this represented the head and shoulders of an ape and the fracture had occurred half-way down the back so that the lower part of the trunk the forearms which apparently hung by its sides and the hind legs were missing on the back there was an inscription in hieroglyphics also broken presumably the missing piece contained the remainder of the letters it was modelled with extreme care and minuteness and the face wore an expression of grotesque malevolence what's this broken bit of a monkey asked hugh carelessly abdul looking much like a monkey himself put his eyes close to it ah that's the rarest thing in egypt he said so mr rankin he tell me if only the monkey not broken see the back there it says he of whom this is let him call on me thrice and then some son of a dog broke it if the rest was here i would not take a hundred pounds for it but now ten years have i kept half monkey and never comes half monkey to it it is yours sir for a pound it is yours half monkey nothing to me it is fool monkey only being half monkey i let it go i give it to you and you give me pound hugh marsham felt in one pocket then in another with no appearance of hurry or eagerness there's your pound he said casually abdul peered at him in the dusk it was very odd that hugh did not offer him half what he asked instead of paying up without bargaining he regretted extremely that he had not asked more but the little blue fragment was now in hugh's pocket and the sovereign glistened very pleasantly in his own palm and what was the rest of the hieroglyphic do you think hugh asked eh allah only knows the wickedness and the power of the monkeys said abdul once there were such an egypt and in the temple of mat and karnak which the english dug up you shall see a chamber with just such monkeys sitting round it four of them all carved in sandstone but on them there is no writing i have looked at them behind and before they not master monkeys perhaps the monkey promised that whoso called on him thrice if he were owner of the blue image of which gentleman has the half would be his master and that monkey would do his bidding who knows it is of the old wickedness of the world the old egyptian blackness hugh got up he had been out in the sun all day and felt at this moment a little intimate shiver which warned him that it was wiser to go indoors till the chill of sunset had passed i expect you've tried it on with the half monkey haven't you he said abdul burst out into a toothless cackle of laughter yes effendi he said i have tried it a hundred times and nothing happens else i would not have sold it to you half monkey is no monkey at all i have tried to make boy with the ink mirror see something about monkeys but nothing comes except the clouds and the man who sweeps no monkey 
hugh nodded to him good night you old sorcerer he said pleasantly as he walked up the broad flagged passage to his room carrying the half monkey in his hand hugh felt with a disengaged thumb in his waistcoat pocket for something he had picked up that day in the valley of the tombs of the kings he had eaten his lunch there after an inspection of the carved and reeking corridors and as he sat idly smoking had reached out a lazy hand to where this thing had glittered among the pebbles now entering his room he turned up the electric light and standing under it with his back to the window that opened door fashion on to the three steps that led into the hotel garden he fitted the fragment he had found to the fragment he had just purchased they joined on each other with the most absolute accuracy not a chip was missing there was the complete ape and down its back ran the complete legend the window was open and at this moment he heard a sudden noise as of some scampering beast in the garden outside his light streamed out in an oblong on to the sandy path and laying the two pieces of the image on the table he looked out but there was nothing irregular to be seen the palm trees waved and clashed in the wind and the rose bushes stirred and scattered their fragrance only right down the middle of the sandy path that ran between the beds the ground was curiously disturbed as by some animal heavily frolicking scooping and spurning the light soil as it ran the midday train from cairo next day brought mr rankin the eminent egyptologist and student of occult lore a huge red man with a complete mastery of colloquial arabic he had but a day to spend in luxor for he was en route for Marawi, where lately some important finds had been made but hugh took occasion to show him the figure of the ape as they sat over their coffee in the garden just outside his bedroom after lunch i found the lower half yesterday outside one of the tombs of the kings he said and the top half by the utmost luck among old abdul's things he told me you said that if it was complete it would be of the greatest rarity he lied i suppose rankin gave one gasp of amazed surprise as he looked at it and read the inscription on the back marsham thought that his great red face suddenly paled good lord he said here take it and he held out the two pieces to him hugh laughed why in such a hurry he said because there comes a breaking point to every man's honesty and i might keep it and swear that i had given it back to you my dear fellow do you know what you've got indeed i don't i want to be told said hugh and to think that it was you who only a couple of months ago asked me what a scarab was well you've got there what all egyptologists and even more keenly than egyptologists all students of folklore and magic black and white especially black would give their eyes to have found good lord what's that hugh was sitting by his side in a deck-chair idly fitting together the two halves of the broken image he too heard what had startled rankin for it was the same noise as had startled him last night namely the scampering of some great frolicsome animal somewhere close to them as he jumped up severing his hands the noise ceased funny he said i heard that last night there's nothing it's some stray dog in the bushes do tell me what it is i've got rankin who had surged to his feet also stood listening a moment but there was nothing to be heard but the buzzing of bees in the bushes and the chiding of the remote kites overhead he sat down again well give me two minutes he said and i can tell you all i know once upon a time when this wonderful and secret land was alive and not dead oh we have killed it with our board schools and our steamers and our religion 
there was a whole hierarchy of gods isis osiris and the rest of whom we know a great deal but below them there was a company of semi-divinities demons if you will of whom we know practically nothing the cat was one certain dwarfish creatures were others but most potent of all were the cynocephaly the dog-faced apes they were not divine rather they were demons of hideous power but and he pointed a great hand at hugh they could be controlled men could control them men could turn them into terrific servants much as the genie and the arabian nights were controlled but to do that you had to know the secret name of the demon and had yourself to make an image of him with the secret name inscribed thereon and by that you could summon him and all the incarnate creatures of his species so much we know from certain very guarded allusions in the book of the dead and other sources for this was one of the great mysteries never openly spoken of here and there a priest in karnak or abydos or in heropolis has handed down to him one of those secret names but in nine cases out of ten the knowledge died with him for there was something dangerous and terrible about it all old abdul here for instance believes that moses had the secret names of frogs and lice and made images of them with the secret name inscribed on them and by those produced the plagues of egypt think what you could do think what he did if infinite power over frog nature were given you so that the king's chamber swarmed with frogs at your word usually as i said the secret name was but sparingly passed on but occasionally some very bold advanced spirit such as moses made his image and controlled he paused a moment and hugh wondered if he was in some delirious dream here they were taking coffee and cigarettes underneath the shadow of a modern hotel in the year a d nineteen twelve and this great savant was talking to him about the spell that controlled the whole frog nature in the universe the gist the moral of his discourse was already perfectly clear that's a good joke hugh said you told your story with extraordinary gravity and what you mean is that these two blue bits i hold in my hand control the whole ape nature of the world bravo rankin for a moment you and your impressiveness almost made me take it all seriously lord you do tell a story well and what's the secret name of the ape rankin turned to him with the shake of an impressive forefinger my dear boy he said you should never be disrespectful towards the things you know nothing of never say a thing is moonshine till you know what you are talking about i know at this moment exactly as much as you do about your ape image except that i can translate its inscription which i will do for you on the top half is written he of whom this is let him call on me thrice hugh interrupted that's what abdul read to me he said of course abdul knows hieroglyphics but on the lower half is what nobody but you and i know let him call on me thrice says the top half and then there speaks what you picked up in the valley of the tombs and i tahumet obey the order of the master tahumet asked hugh yes now in ten minutes i must be off to catch my train what i have told you is all that is known about this particular affair by those who have studied folklore and magic and egyptology if anything if anything happens do be kind enough to let me know if you were not so abominably rich i would offer you what you liked for that little broken statue but there's the way of the world oh it's not for sale said hugh gaily it's too interesting to sell but what am i to do next with it tahomet shall i say tahomet three times rankin leaned forward very hurriedly and laid his fat hand on the young man's knee no for heaven's sake just keep it by you he said 
be patient with it see what happens you might mend it perhaps put a drop of gum arabic on the break and make it whole by the way if it interests you at all my niece julia draycott arrives here this evening and will wait for me here till my return from Marawi. you met her in cairo i think certainly this piece of news interested hugh more than all the possibilities of apes and super apes he thrust the two pieces of tahomet carelessly into his pocket by jove is she really he said that's splendid she told me she might be coming up but didn't feel at all sure must you really be off i shall come down to the station with you while rankin went to gather up such small luggage as he had brought with him hugh wandered into the hotel bureau to ask for letters and seeing there a gum bottle dabbed with gum the fractured edges of tahomet the two pieces joined with absolute exactitude and wrapping a piece of paper round them to keep the edges together he went out through the garden with rankin at the hotel gate was the usual crowd of donkey boys and beggars and presently they were ambling down the village street on bored white donkeys it was almost deserted at this hottest hour of the afternoon but along it there moved an arab leading a large grey ape that tramped surlily in the dust but just before they overtook it the beast looked round saw hugh and with chatterings of delight strained at his leash its owner cursed and pulled it away for hugh nearly rode over it but it paid no attention to him and fairly towed him along the road after the donkeys rankin looked at his companion that's odd he said that's one of your servants i've still a couple of minutes to spare do you mind stopping a moment he shouted something in the vernacular to the arab who ran after them with the beast still towing him on when they came close the ape stopped and bent his head to the ground in front of hugh and that's odd said rankin hugh suddenly felt rather uncomfortable nonsense he said that's just one of his tricks he's been taught it to get backsheesh for his master look there's your train coming in we must get on he threw a couple of piastres to the man and they rode on but when they got to the station glancing down the road he saw that the ape was still looking after them julia draycott's arrival that evening speedily put such antique imaginings as the lordship of apes out of hugh's head he chucked tahumet into the box where he kept his scarabs and ushapti figures and devoted himself to this heartless and exquisite girl whose mission in life appeared to be to make as miserable as possible the largest possible number of young men hugh had already been selected by her in cairo as a decent victim and now she proceeded to torture him she had no intention what ever of marrying him for poor hugh was certainly ugly with his broad heavy face and though rich he was not nearly rich enough but he had a couple of delightful arab horses and so since there was no one else on hand to experiment with she let him buy her a side saddle and be with his horses always at her disposal she did not propose to use him for very long for she expected young lord patterson whom she did intend to marry to follow her from cairo within a week she had beat a parthian retreat from him being convinced that he would soon find cairo intolerable without her and in the meantime hugh was excellent practice besides she adored riding they sat together one afternoon on the edge of the river opposite karnak she had treated him like a brute beast all morning and had watched his capability for wretchedness with the purring egoism that distinguished her and now as a change she was seeing how happy she could make him you are such a dear she said i don't know how i could have endured luxor without you and thanks to you it has been the loveliest week 
she looked at him from below her long lashes through which there gleamed the divinest violet smiling like a child at her friend and to-night you made some delicious plan for to-night yes it's full moon to-night said he we are going to ride out to karnak after dinner that will be heavenly and mr marsham do let us go alone there's sure to be a mob from the hotel so let's start late when they've all cleared out karnak in the moonlight just with you that completely made hugh's mind up for the last three days he had been on the lookout for a moment that should furnish the great occasion and now all unconsciously of course she indicated it to him this evening then and his heart leaped yes yes he said but why have i become mr marsham again again she looked at him now with a penitent mouth oh i was such a beast to you this morning she said that was why i didn't deserve that you should be hugh but will you be hugh again do you forgive me in spite of hugh's fixing the great occasion for this evening it might have come then so bewitching was her penitence had not the rest of their party on donkeys whom they had outpaced come streaming along the river bank at this moment ah those tiresome people she said hughie what a bore everybody else is except you and me they got back to the hotel about sunset and as they passed into the hall the porter handed julia a telegram which had been waiting some couple of hours she gave a little exclamation of pleasure and surprise and turned to hugh come and have a turn in the garden hughie she said and then i must go down for the arrival of the boat when does it come in i should think it would be here immediately he said let's go down to the river even as he spoke the whistle of the approaching steamer was heard the girl hesitated a moment it's a shame to take up all your time in the way i'm doing she said you told me you had letters to write write them now then then you'll be free after dinner to-morrow will do he said i'll come down with you to the boat no you dear i forbid it she said oh do be good and write your letters i ask you to rather puzzled and vaguely uncomfortable hugh went into the hotel it was true that he had told her he had letters that should have been written a week ago but something at the back of his mind insisted that this was not the girl's real reason for wanting him to do his task now she wanted to go and meet the boat alone and on the moment an unfounded jealousy stirred like a coiled snake in him he told himself that it might be some inconvenient aunt whom she was going to meet but such a suggestion did not in the least satisfy him when he remembered the obvious pleasure with which she had read the telegram that no doubt announced this arrival but he nailed himself to his writing-table till a couple of very tepid letters were finished and then with growing restlessness went out through the hall into the warm still night most of the hotel had gone indoors to dress for dinner but sitting on the veranda with her back to him was julia a chair was drawn in front of her and facing her was a young man on whose face the light shone he was looking eagerly at her and his hand rested on her knee hugh turned abruptly and went back into the hotel he and julia for these last three days had with two other friends made a very pleasant party of four at lunch and dinner to-night when he entered the dining-room he found that places were laid here for three only and that at a far distant table in the window were sitting julia and the young man whom he had seen with her on the veranda his identity was casually disclosed as dinner went on one of his companions had seen lord patterson in cairo 
hugh had only a wandering ear for table talk but a quick glancing eye ever growing more sombre for those in the window and his heavy face as he noted the tokens and signs of their intimacy grew sullen and savage then before dinner was over they rose and passed out into the garden jealousy can no more bear to lose sight of those to whom it owes its miseries than love can bear to be parted from the object of its adoration and presently hugh and his two friends went and sat as was usual with them on the veranda outside here and there about the garden were wandering couples and in the light of the full moon which was to be their lamp at karnak to-night when the tiresome people had gone he soon identified julia and lord patterson they passed and repassed down a rose-embowered alley hidden sometimes behind bushes and then appearing again for a few paces and each sight of them each vanishing of them again served but to confirm that which already needed no confirmation and as his jealousy grew every moment more bitter so every moment hugh grew more and more dangerously enraged apparently lord patterson was not one of the tiresome people whom julia longed to get away from presently his two companions left him for they were starting now to ride out to karnak and hugh sat on smoking and throwing away half consumed an endless series of cigarettes he had ordered that his two horses one with a side saddle should be ready at ten and at ten he meant to go to the girl and remind her of her engagement till then he would wait here wait and watch if the veranda had been on fire he felt he could not have left it to seek safety in some place where he was unable to see the bushy path where the two strolled then they emerged from that on to the broader walk that led straight to where he was sitting and after a few whispered words lord patterson left her there and came quickly towards the hotel he passed close by hugh gave him so hugh thought a glance of amused derision and went into the hotel julia came quickly towards him when lord patterson had gone oh hughie she said will you be a tremendous angel lord patterson yes he's just gone in such a dear you would delight in him lord patterson's only here for one night and he's dying to see karnak by moonlight so will you lend us your horses he absolutely insists i should go out there with him the amazing effrontery of this took hugh's breath away and in that moment's pause his rage flamed within him i thought you were going out with me he said i was but well you see she made the penitent mouth again which had seemed so enchanting to him this afternoon oh hughie don't you understand she said hugh got up feeling himself to be one shaking black jelly of wounded anger i'm not sure i do he said but no doubt i soon shall anyhow i want to ask you something i want you to promise to marry me she opened her great childlike eyes to their widest then they closed into mere slits again as she broke out into a laugh marry you she said you silly darling fellow that is a good joke suddenly from the garden there sounded the jubilant scamper of running feet and next moment a great grey ape sprang on to the veranda beside them and looked eagerly with keen dog's eyes at hugh as if intent on obeying some yet unspoken command julia gave a little shriek of fright and clung to him oh that horrible animal she cried hughie take care of me some sudden ray of illumination came to hugh all the extraordinary fantastic things that rankin had said to him became sober and real 
and simultaneously the girl's clinging fingers on his arm became like the touch of some poisonous praying thing snake coil or suckers of an octopus or hooked wings of a vampire bat something within him still shook and trembled like a quicksand but his conscious mind was quite clear and collected go away he said to the ape and pointed into the garden and it scampered off still gleefully spurning and kicking the soft sandy path then he quietly turned to the girl there it's gone he said it was just some tame thing escaped i saw it or one like it the other day on the end of a string as for the horses i shall be delighted to let you and lord patterson have them it is ten now they will be round the girl had quite recovered from her fright ah hughie you are a dear she said and you do understand yes perfectly said he julia went to dress herself for riding and presently hugh saw them off from the gate with courteous wishes for a pleasant ride then he went back to his bedroom and opened the little box where he kept his scarabs an hour later he was walking out alone on the road to karnak and in his pocket was the image of tahumet he had formed no clear idea of what he was meaning to do the immediate reason for his expedition was that once again he could not bear to lose sight of julia and her companion the moon was high the feathery outline of palm groves was clearly and delicately etched on the dark velvet of the heavens and stars sat among their branches like specks of golden fruit the caressing scent of bean flowers was wafted over the road and often he had to stand aside to let pass a group of noisy tourists mounted on white donkeys coming riotously home from the showpiece of karnak by moonlight then striking off the road he passed beside the horseshoe lake in the depths of whose black waters the stars burned unwaveringly and by the entrance of the ruined temple of mut and then with a stab of jealousy that screamed for its revenge he saw tied up to a pillar just within his own horses so they were here he gave the beasts a wide berth lest recognizing him they should whinny and perhaps betray his presence and creeping in the shadow of the walls behind the row of great cat-headed statues he stole into the inner court of the temple here for the first time he caught sight of the two at the far end of the enclosure and as they turned white-faced in the moonlight he saw patterson kiss the girl and they stood there with neck and arms interlaced then they began walking towards him again and he stepped into a dark chamber on his right to avoid meeting them it had that strange stale animal odour about it that hangs in egyptian temples and with a thrill of glee he saw by a ray of moonlight that streamed in through the door that by chance he had stepped into the shrine round which sit the dog-faced apes whose secret name he knew and whose controlling spell lay in his breast-pocket often he had felt the underworld horror that dwelt here as a thing petrified and corpse-like to-night it was petrified no longer for the images seemed tense and quivering with the life that at any moment he could put into them their faces leered and hated and lusted and all that demoniac power which seemed to be flowing into him from them was his to use as he wished rankin's fantastic tales were bursting with reality he knew with the certainty with which the night watcher waits for the day that the lordship of the spirit of apes incarnate and discarnate would descend on him as on some anointed king the moment he thrice pronounced the secret name he was going to do it too he knew also that all he hesitated for now was to determine what orders their lord should give it seemed that the image in his breast-pocket was aware for it throbbed and vibrated against his chest like a boiling kettle he could not make up his mind what to do 
but fed as with fuel by jealousy and love and hate and revenge his sense of the magical control he wielded could be resisted no longer but boiled over and he drew from his pocket the image where was engraven the secret name tahumet 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 he shouted aloud there was a moment's absolute stillness then came a wild scream of fright from his horses and he heard them gallop off madly into the night slowly like a lamp turned down and then finally turned out the blaze of the moon faded into utter darkness and in that darkness which whispered with a gradually increasing noise of scratchings and scamperings he felt that the walls of the narrow chamber where he stood were as in a dream going farther and farther away from him until though still the darkness was impenetrable he knew that he was standing in some immense space one wall he fancied was still near him close behind him but the space which was full of he knew not what unseen presences extended away and away to both sides of him and in front of him then he was aware that he was not standing but sitting for beneath his hands he could feel the arms as of some throne of which the seat's edge pressed him just below his knees the animal odour he had noticed before increased enormously in pungency and he sniffed it in ecstatically as if it had been the scent of bean-fields and mixed with it was the sweetness of incense and the savour as of roast meat and at that the withdrawn light began to glow once more only now it was not the whiteness of the moon but a redder glow as of flames that aspired and sank again he saw where he was now he was seated on a chair of pink granite and a little in front of him was a huge altar on which limbs smoked overhead was a low roof supported at intervals by painted pillars and the whole of the vast floor was full of great grey apes squatting in dense rows sometimes they all bowed their heads to the ground sometimes as by a signal they raised them again and myriads of obscene expectant eyes faced him they glowed from within as cat's eyes glow in the dusk but with an infinity of hellish power all that power was his to command and he gloried in it bring them in he said and no more indeed he was not sure if he said it it was just his thought but as if he spoke the soundless language of animals they understood and they clambered and leaped over each other to do his bidding then a huddled wave of them surged up in front of where he sat and as it broke in foam of evil eyes and paws and switching tails it disclosed the two whom he had ordered to be brought before him and what shall i do with them he asked himself cudgelling his monkey brain for some infamous invention kiss each other he said at length in order to inflame the brutality of his jealousy further and he laughed chatteringly as their white trembling lips met he felt that all remnants of humanity were draining from him there was but a little left in his whole nature that could be deemed to belong to a man a hundred awful schemes ran about through his brain as sparks of fire run through the charred ashes of burnt paper and then julia turned her face towards him in the hideous entry that she had made in that wave of apes her hair had fallen down and streamed over her shoulders and at that the sight of a woman's hair unbound the remnant of his manhood all that was not submerged in the foulness of his supreme apehood made one tremendous appeal to him like some final convulsion of the dying and at the bidding of that impulse his hands came together and snapped the image in two something screamed 
the whole temple yelled with it and mixed with it was a roaring in his ears as of great waters or hurricane winds he stamped on the broken image grinding it to powder below his heel and felt the ground and the temple walls rocking round him then he heard someone not far off speaking in human voice again and no music could be so sweet let's get out of the place darling it said that was an earthquake and the horses have bolted he heard running steps outside which gradually grew fainter the moon shone whitely into the little chamber with the grotesque stone apes and at his feet was the powdered blue glaze and baked white clay of the image he had ground to dust end of section ten